sharing with me that. Look, Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't use a PowerPoint. So I'm not right, so I'm being discipled by Jesus. No PowerPoint today. Um, May is typically a missions month for the Baptist Church. And uh, I thought I would avail myself of some of their material for today. And uh, what, what sort of happened is, I sort of grabbed hold of this, but, but as we went further along, it sort of, sort of changed into not their material so much, but really what God placed on my heart. So let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into this. Father God, we thank you so much for how you shared with us today. Father, thank you for the, the generosity you have for us. And thank you that that's a, a thing you're growing in us, you're drawing us into. Thank you. Now, Father, as we come and we want to look at your word, Father, we want to look at, at, uh, at something about prayer today, Father. I want to ask, Father, that you would, uh, you would open our hearts and our minds, Father, that we would uh, know full well, Father, um, you're speaking to us. Father, I pray, Lord, that, uh, that when we read your word, Father, it would have a, an effect on us because it's living and it brings life. Father, help us today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, last year, Missions Month, uh, Baptist Churches of Australia encouraged us to, to go across the road. Yeah? And today they're encouraging us in another word. That word is alongside us. It's not really a word we would use very much um, or describe people very much. They did have like a video and I thought we could show the video, but that would mean I couldn't preach for as long. And so... I thought I would, do, I would preach longer. But I'm sure you'd be happy about that. Alongside us. A people on mission are a people who come alongside. And there's some characteristics of alongside, alongside us that identify and build a people of mission. Coming alongside of someone is a way in which we might disciple them. And discipleship when all is said and done, is what mission is really all about. Jesus commands us, doesn't he? He says, go into all the world, and he doesn't say have uh, worship services. He doesn't say have prayer meetings. He doesn't say have fellowship dinners. He says, go into all the world and make disciples. Doesn't he? You know what it says? Teaching everyone to... Obey what he says, baptising them into the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That's the mission we have. That's the mission God has. That's the mission we're invited into. And coming alongside of someone is how we might make disciples. Make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Yeah. The word is essentially what God has done for us, isn't it? God has come alongside us. In a few weeks' time, it will be Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes. We celebrate that time. It's the birthday of the church. Yeah. And Jesus, when he talks about the Holy Spirit in, in John, in that, those beautiful discourses at the end of John's Gospel, he calls the Holy Spirit the Advocate. An Advocate means someone who comes alongside of. And, and so the Holy Spirit is Jesus, not only in us, but Jesus alongside us. So being alongside is a part of, of mission. Now, Baptist Mission Australia gave, gave this sort of definition of being alongside, and I feel as though if I don't give you that, I've, I've not done my job properly in, in taking their material. So this is what they say. I say, being an alongsider 
means listening, showing hospitality, bringing peace, and humbly sharing the good news of Jesus. It means praying and seeking the Spirit's leading. It means loving the people God has put in your world, as well as loving the world in which we live, as opposed to the systems of this world. It means sharing God's love in genuine, active and relevant ways. It means partnering together with each other in God. Sending and being sent, giving and receiving, working together as partners in God's mission. So we're going to look today at being alongside us, but with respect to prayer. That was the first topic they had. And we're going to highlight two things that prayer means in this role. Firstly, we're going to see that prayer empowers us for mission. And it does that by facilitating and developing an intimate relationship with God. And it also does that by changing the prayer so that our hearts begin to match God's. And secondly, we'll understand that prayer opens doors for the gospel. It does this in both material ways and in spiritual ways. So, two points that each have two points. So, let's go, hey? So, prayer empowers us for mission. This is an ideal time to have a PowerPoint. Yeah, because we like doing those things. Prayer empowers us for mission. And it seems like the most obvious thing to say. In fact... It appears like a bit of a slogan. Prayer empowers people for mission. But when we try and unpack it, it's anything but obvious and anything but trite. It is paramount and should have preeminence in any of our work surrounding mission. The question that probably stirs me the most, and while I was I was preparing this, stirred in my heart, was if prayer for empowerment is so obvious and so important, then why don't I do it? Why don't we do it? And of course that's a bit of an assumption, but at corporate times of prayer on a, a certainly not overflowing with people or contributors, either on a Sunday morning or a Sunday afternoon, we gather, you know, it's on our, our, our notices, our PowerPoint every week, Sunday afternoon, we will gather for an hour to pray for the city, for revival in the city, for renewal in this church. Pause. Once a month, the Middletons aren't here, I can embarrass them for my life. For longer than I've been here, they've been having a monthly prayer meeting in their home. Do we know about that? If that's news to you, put your hand up. Except for those who are here. Don't know what's coming. Not you. Um, anybody else? Is that news to you? How many people do you reckon attend? There would be... Well, two of them live there. It's hard for them not to attend. So there's not very many, yeah? But it's obvious that prayer empowers people for mission. Isn't that obvious? <coughs> Even on a personal level, if I was to do a survey and ask people if they were satisfied with their prayer life, I doubt too many would, would tick the 60 minutes I'm satisfied boxes in that survey. I know I would struggle to... Tick those boxes. We struggle to lead a satisfactory prayer life even though we know we should be. Because this is how we develop an intimate relationship with God. And those, like most things to do with Jesus, we need to start with Jesus. Yeah. Alongside us are a people of prayer, firstly because Jesus is a person of prayer. Prayer empowers us for mission because prayer empowered Jesus for mission. It's not like we make this stuff up. Very early on in Mark's Gospel, we read 
about Jesus and prayer. In Mark 1, 35-39, we read this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, if you want to know when to pray, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house and went off to a solitary pray place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you! Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus connects prayer with fruitful ministry and the knowledge of God's mission to which he is called. If we want to have fruitful ministry, if we want to know what God's about for us, prayer is the key. If we were to read all of the gospel, we would see that Jesus does this from time to time. Mark records it. Jesus goes and he spends intimate time with the Father. He encourages his followers to do the same thing when, after he sends them out to minister. Two by two in, in Mark 6. When they come back, Jesus says, come, let's go aside. Let us draw aside, away from everybody. Go to a quiet place. The quiet place and rest were to refresh themselves themselves in God. And we get a sense that this is quite a habit for Jesus. It was how he maintains both his freshness and his power in ministry. And we need to remember that prayer is not the prayer itself that empowered Jesus. It's not like Jesus goes off to a quiet place and says, Shazam! And all of a sudden, he's able to do stuff. It's not that there's a, there's a thing like we, we hear people say, I believe in the power of prayer. Have we heard that before? That's not new to us, is it? People say, I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of prayer. But we can't believe it like it's a tool that we wield to manipulate God into doing something that he hasn't already decided to do or hasn't entered his imagination to do. That is not the power of prayer. Is that the power of prayer? Is that what we think we're doing when we pray? Manipulating God. Make him do stuff. Is that the power of prayer? Does it mean that we have to be articulate and clear and, and so well spoken? Is that what the power of prayer is? Is that what's important about prayer? The power is not in the words we say. The power is in the relationship we have. Isn't it? Isn't that where the power lay? Doesn't the power lay with God? Yeah. When we say we believe in the power of prayer, we believe in the God whom we pray to, that he is powerful. And that's what happens with Jesus. Isn't it? Jesus believes in the Father. And the power that he ministers is the Father's power comes through him. It's about the relationship. If prayer was able to be manipulated, if it was a manipulation of the Father, Jesus would have to have been the best. But when we see Jesus pray in these two beautiful places at the end of his life, in John 17, we have this great high priestly prayer. And then in the Synoptic Gospels, we have Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah? Takes his three closest disciples who are with him. Says, you wait there, you pray. Pray. Jesus says, pray. And he goes up over there and he prays deeply. Yeah? And if, Jesus was, if prayer was about manipulating God, twisting God's arm, we wouldn't have those prayers, would we? Because Jesus prays, Father, if it's at all possible, take this cup away from me. But not my will, but yours be done. 
they're not a manipulation of the of the Father's will to come in line with their desires, but rather prayer, intimate prayer, powerful prayer, is the outworking of the Father's will. Jesus' power to fulfil that will is the stuff of powerful prayer, it's the intimate relationship that prayer fosters and reflects that empowers Jesus to the cross and to our salvation. There's a direct relationship between uh, that's, that's between the intimate relationship fostered by prayer and the person empowered in mission. It's something that God's been trying to teach my stubborn heart and my sick head for a long time. This is not about ministry skills but about ministry power. It's not about ministry faithfulness, but about ministry fruitfulness. It's about ministering God's salvation for sin. Sin that so powerfully afflicts all people in this desperately dying world. A world that incredibly is unaware of its, its eternal mortality and even less aware of its divine cure. Jonathan Edwards, probably America's most celebrated uh, ministers of the 1730s and 1740s. He was instrumental in the spiritual awakenings in America in those times. He's often described as a dull and monotone preacher. A dull and monotone preacher. Who would come to see him now? We like energetic, powerful preachers. In a different mould. It's probably an overstatement. He was probably not completely dull and monotone. But it's certainly no, it's certainly no overstatement to say that God used his sermons to bring about an awakening to God in North America, perhaps more than anyone else. What his sermons might have lacked in delivery was more than counted by their power to affect the hearts of people and the minds of his listeners. There's quite a dramatic uh, biography about him preaching one of his most fam famous sermons, um, a sermon that was tight-knit and he read with his head bowed most of the time, called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And as he's proclaiming this, people are hanging on to the pews as if they're going to slip into, the, into the, the very pits of hell as he's preaching. God had an amazing effect. It wasn't Jonathan Edwards, it was the Spirit of God, it was the Word of God affecting people's hearts and their lives. And he would say it that way too. Now in his preparation for his sermons and of himself as the preacher, it was prayer and time spent with God that became the cornerstone of what it produced. And the intimacy of relationship, God brought forth power and fruitfulness as well as skills and faithfulness. We seem to flip it around a bit, don't we? We seem to think that actually what's the most important is your skills and your faithfulness. Well, it appears to me that what's most important is the relationship and the fruitfulness. There's no one way to develop this intimacy with God. Let me briefly suggest three obvious things that characterise a person and a people who seek to cultivate a powerful, intimate relationship with God. There are more, but this is not that sermon. That sermon might come another time. So firstly, time. We can't, can't, we can't develop a relationship with anything unless we put time into it. Prioritise time with God. It's a not negotiable. It's something that has to happen. It's sacred. Just like Jesus, people who want to have an intimate relationship with God 
Churches that want to have an intimate relationship with God take time, to, time out to be with God. They desire intimacy, so the relationship is two-way. It's not just me talking and then I go away. Yeah? Me talking and I go. Husbands often get accused of being like this. Wives talk and then the husbands just go away. Yeah? It's not a way to develop an intimate relationship, is it? Those of you who are married will know this. Husbands and wives need to communicate together. It's not just the wife talking and the husband grunting. It needs words to go back with forwards. When we develop an intimate relationship with God, we need that two-way communication. We need to hear God as well. We need to stop to listen. The second thing I want to talk about, the second point, surrender. People who want that intimate relationship with God surrender their goals, their desires, their dreams to God. Because it's not a relationship of equals. Is it? It's not like it's not like we we're buddies so much. God is God and I am not. That's one of the hardest lessons to learn. Isn't it? Surrender. We ask the question, not what what do I want God to do, not do I want what do I want from God, but rather what does God want from me? Thirdly, obedience. They commit to what God commands. Obedience is important to them. Their availability to God is matched by their obedience to God. Those are three small things, obvious things, if we took a little time to think about them. That's how we would develop a relationship with God. This intimate relationship with God changes the person who prays. And it changes what that person prays. It empowers our life for mission, for sharing Jesus in word and in deed. So if you're taking notes, part B of part one is prayer changes the person and the people praying. Jeremiah the prophet tells me that the heart of man is desperately wicked. There's a sense that we don't even know how deceitful and desperately wicked our hearts are. I think the prophet knew a few things about a person's heart. Later when he talks about the new covenant that Jesus is inaugurating by his by by his death, in that new covenant, we're promised a changed heart. A new heart. One that is no longer rock hard and impervious to God. But we're promised a soft heart that is malleable in his hands. And there's so much we can say about prayer and about what it does to our heart. But sometimes, <laughs> what prayer does is not what I want it to do. I don't, sometimes prayer and God results in stuff in me that is not what I wanted when I started out. I don't know about you, but it seems like the closer I draw to God through intimate, deep prayer, the more sinful I come to see myself. The more I find myself in need of God's grace in Christ Jesus... I'm reminded by Isaiah with that great vision he saw of God in his temple. Yeah? In his heavenly temple, the train of his robe went from heaven to earth. Remember? Isaiah chapter 6. And he has this vision. He's drawn close to God and he hears the angels singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And what does Isaiah do? He says, Woe is me. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in a people of unclean lips. He draws near to God and the first thing he recognises is his sinfulness before God. And that's not the, the desired outcome for us. 
I want to be close to God. I want all power in my life from God. I want to come on my sin. I just want to recognise that I'm a sinner because I know I'm a sinner already, but I don't know how much of a sinner I am already. I recognise that sin still lives in me when I draw near to God. I never seem to be free from it. I also recognise how much I seem to like my sin. And that's not a good thing for the pastor to say. The pastor's meant to say he hates sin in his life, but sometimes I think we like sin. Otherwise we wouldn't keep doing it. If we hated it, we wouldn't do it. I recognise that God still has much work to do in me to lead me to the grace of Christ in his cross and resurrection. And prayer does this in a person and in people who pray. But it's not just any sort of prayer, is it? We can't do this if our prayer is simply a list of things, God, I want you to do. Because there's people who are in a bad way. I need you to do this in their life. The sort of prayer that we need is the prayer that wants to develop intimacy with God, that desires to know God and to be known by God. Desiring intimacy with God changes our hearts and our wants and our desires by first exposing them and comparing them to God's heart before offering to renew our heart. And many of us know that this has an effect on how we live and what we do. If this is what God does for us as individuals when we pray for our, on our own, what will he do when, he comes, when it comes to a people, a group of people, a church perhaps, that desire intimacy with him? 2 Chronicles 7, 14 tells us something about that. The verse is from a larger response that God gives to Solomon after Solomon has dedicated the temple. And in that prayer of dedication to the temple, Solomon says this amazing thing. He says, says Lord, we're going we're gonna to go astray, Lord, and you're going to banish us and send us away. He says in his prayer, Solomon, a long time before the exile, but he says this in his prayer. And he says, in his prayer, he says, oh, um, but when, we, when you send us away, if we turn back to you, will you please forgive us? And bring us back home. And so God he says a whole lot of other things to Solomon, but he also says this. He says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. The actions of humbling oneself, of prayer, of seeking God's face, of turning from one's Wicked ways are the action of corporate revival and renewal. So the corporate equivalent of the pers personal desire to have intimacy with God. They're the action of a church that wants to be renewed. But it's important that, that the focus of the action is not the reward. It's not that God will heal their land. Rather, the focus is on God and the relationship with Him. And that will include the forgiveness of, cor of corporate sins and an increased sensitivity to them. The result, or the reward, will look after itself. Isn't that right? Isn't that what it's like in our own lives? The rewards come. So, part two, point two. Point two is shorter than point one. Margin. Um, prayer, point two, prayer opens the door for the gospel. What prayer does for the individual and for the church also does the equivalent for the gospel. When I first read this in the resources from Baptist Mission Australia, I have to sort of mention that every now and then. It's not a contractual obligation, but just to remind ourselves that this is where it started. When I first read the resources, I thought of Acts 4. Straight away, I thought of Acts 4. And we know the passage, I think. 
Peter and John, after healing the, uh, the lame beggar at the gate, beautiful, they're arrested, brought before the Sanhedrin. And they're questioned there in the end because the council don't know how to punish them appropriately. After all, they've done this incredible miracle and after all, they are unschooled fishermen. We don't know what to do with them. They say, don't you dare speak about the Lord Jesus or about Jesus or about that man ever again. You're forbidden to do that. And then they release them. And Peter and John, the first thing they do is they go to the church. They go to the church and explain to them what happened. And the first thing the church does is pray. It's the first thing they do. They pray. And they pray that they might continue to preach the gospel with boldness and that God would extend his hand to perform signs and wonders to confirm that. And God did. God did. God opened the door for the gospel. And Paul too, more than, more than once in his letters, he asked people, pray for me. In, in Ephesians 6, Colossians 4, he says, pray for me that I might preach the gospel appropriately as I should. And by that I mean that Paul would be be wanting to proclaim the word and proclaim the gospel indeed. And the good news that he wants to proclaim is that Jesus saves sinners. That's what he's concerned about. He's concerned about that. I want to preach the gospel. Jesus saves sinners. I don't want to talk about slavery. I don't want to talk about uh, Roman oppression. I don't want to talk about the politics of all of that. I want to talk about Jesus saves sinners. Sinners. Because that's what's really important about the gospel. That's what's really important about the salvation we have. Two points here, I think. Prayer opens the, the way of the gospel in two ways. In a material way and in a spiritual way. In the material way, prayer allows us to hear and discern what the sovereign God is saying with respect to his gospel about how, when, and where we proclaim it. Again, I'm reminded of Paul in Acts. Paul is a treasure trove. Yeah, Acts is a treasure trove. Paul, I think we can conclude, was a person of prayer. He learned prayer as a young man. He was taught by a rabbi. He became a Pharisee. He would have known prayer. There are times of prayer. You pray at those times every day. That's what you do. That's what his life was like that. It was a habit. And what do you think happened to him after he met Jesus? Do you think he became less a man of prayer? No, he became more a man of prayer because now he never taught people to pray at these times of the day. He said, pray continually. Pray always. Always pray. In Acts 16, 6 to 10, we read how he was materially directed through prayer. That reads this, Paul and his companions travelled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. In both negative and positive ways, God gives Paul material help through the relationship he has established with his disciple in prayer. How else would Paul know that the road to the gospel is blocked in Asia and open to Macedonia. How else would he know? And this is not the only time prayer helps him materially for the sake of the gospel. And it's not in only that way that it happens for people. I remember when Carol and I were on a short-term mission trip to Turkey last century. 
how long ago it was, last century. And I still remember it. I'm not that old. It was my turn to give a Bible study. I was going through the, the book of Acts, my turn to give the Bible study. And the Bible study was on Acts 16, another chapter, a place where God provides materially for Paul for the sake of the gospel. Paul and Silas are imprisoned in Philippi. And while the story is, uh, uh, it's how God provides for them through prayer, praise, yeah, for the sake of the gospel, not that they would escape, but that people would be saved. Other things happened for us. Most of the team determined that later, when they'd, on that day, after we'd had that study, they determined that day how great it would be while we're doing our, our mission stuff, how great would it be if some of us got arrested and thrown in jail, just like Paul and Silas. Carol and I thought we'd never heard anything so stupid in our entire life. How stupid. But we got And because of the nature of ministry in Turkey, Carol and I were not teamed together to do this survey work. I was teamed with the leader of the team and Carol was teamed with another girl who knew some Turkish. And Carol and her partner asked three people about Jesus to fill out the survey and then they were arrested. The three people they'd asked all had connections to the police. Now, I don't want to tell Carol's story, she can tell her story and tell it well. But from my perspective, when they did not meet us at the rendezvous later that afternoon, I became a little bit anxious. Turkey is not a safe place for ministers of the gospel. My mind raced, especially when our leader got back and told us, he said, go back to the campsite, everybody go back to the campsite. I'll stay here and see what I can do. My mind, mind raced in the context of what God was doing for mission. In this falling world, all I could hear was a cacophony of voices in the van saying how lucky they are to be arrested for the sake of the gospel. I called out to God as we drove off, leaving my wife behind in the city. And Jesus answered my prayer. He said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It will be okay. There's nothing to hold on to except God's word. Accept the intimacy of relationship where God provides materially for the gospel. As you can see, Carol is with me. She's not imprisoned in Turkey. So, God helps us materially for the sake of the gospel, but also spiritually. There's spiritual help. Prayer enables spiritual help in ministering the gospel by making the gospel powerful and fruitful. In Acts 9, Acts, uh, sorry, Acts 18, 9 to 11, we read this about Paul in Corinth. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. It's a great few verses. It's beautiful few verses. I love these verses so much because I feel them for this city. I feel them that this is God's word for this place. God provides Paul with the material help he needs to remain in Corinth, but he also opens a door for fruitful, powerful gospel proclamation. God had many people in Corinth. God had many people, even though most of them didn't know that God had them. Most of them weren't there yet. This is about gospel fruitfulness in this place. And the only way they could become God's people is through the gospel. It's through the gospel. That's what I want for here in my other. I believe God has many people in this place. But the only way they can become in God's kingdom, in God's people, 
is through the gospel. You can't come by immigration. You can't come by a test. You can only come by being born again. In a similar way, Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians about his desire to see them again in 1 Corinthians 16, 5 to 9, he says this, perhaps I'll stay with you a while, he says, or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do, for I do not want to see you now and make it only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. A great door for effective work God has opened for Paul. The effective work for Paul is gospel work. The effective work is about people understanding the effective nature of the gospel. And that effective work for Paul is about people knowing the effective salvation that Jesus has wrought for them in his cross and resurrection, ministered to them by the Holy Spirit. That's the effective work that God has opened, with a great door for the gospel. Again, this is the verse I cling to for this city. That God would open a door for us for effective work of the gospel. We need God to do that here. No amount of technique, no amount of money, no amount of resources will do it. It's not what we want. No amount of leather box drops with leaflets. No amount of worship services will make it happen. No amount of proclaiming, even in this room, even speaking the name of Jesus over things, is what is needed to affect this city with the gospel. Not without this other thing first. First things must be first. And if we think we have an important destiny for the salvation of people in this city of Wyala, if we think that God has chosen and called Wyala Baptist Church to be a part of those plans that he has, part of those people who will bring the gospel of God's salvation to the dying people of this city, then first things must be first. Hunger for Jesus. Hunger for him. Spend time with him because you love him. Pray with total availability and follow with radical obedience. Humble yourself. Seek his faith with everything you have with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. Pray dangerous and desperate prayers. Turn from your wicked ways, because I know you have them. First things must be first. Come alongside Jesus, and as he comes alongside you, Come alongside others in the power and love of the gospel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much. You don't give up on us. Each of us here, we are. We're just hanging on by your love, really. None of us are... Uh, are self-righteous, none of us have got it all together. But you have it together. Father, as we as we seek you, Father, I want to pray that you would, by the Spirit, you would not give up on us. That you would try again and again. Father, our hearts and our heads, we make them so hard sometimes. Make us hungry for Jesus. Give us an appetite for him. To love him. To be radically obedient to him. Totally alone. 
Father, give us those desperate and dangerous prayers. Place them on our heart. That, Father, we might be, Father, workers in your harvest field. That through each of us, people might know Jesus. That they first things be first, we pray. In Jesus' name.